Do you remember the whole repo crisis? Yeah, that's really old news, I know. But guess what? It's still going on. The news doesn't care about it, that's for sure. Financial analysts definitely gave up trying to understand it, but it's still there regardless. The IMF, who is funded in part by your tax dollars, has pledged $50 billion to help out the current situation globally. This has sent another positive spike into the stock market. Fantastic. No need to worry anymore, every everyone. More bailouts will fix it. You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. Today we are going to look at what's going on. I'm going to show you the markets themselves. We're going to talk about the bond market, the stock market. I'm going to look at the repo crisis as well. Yes, believe it or not, it's still going on. There's so much more in this video that I need to get into, so let's begin by taking a look at the markets themselves. Here you can see another very positive day for the markets, almost 1,200 points up on the Dow Jones. We are looking at the VIX at around 32. Volatility is declining rapidly and we know exactly why. The bailouts are coming. The bailouts are coming. We had $18 billion from the World Bank and now we have $50 billion from the IMF. Of course, all of the governments themselves are having Having their own packages and so on. You've probably seen that in the news as well. This is fantastic because that's going to solve the crisis, right? Well, maybe not, but let's look at the data regardless. Kramer's most trusted market indicator says to start buying stocks. That's right. Jim Kramer, the most trusted name in investing, tells you that it is your time right now to buy stocks. He says this despite the bearish signal emanating from U.S. Treasuries. This is what we've been covering. Obviously, we have had the yield curve inversion and then we had the steepening. And that is a major signal to those paying attention. The Federal Reserve cut interest rates by 50 basis points and as a result yields have been absolutely decimated across the entire bond market now for this particular indicator he's talking about the market edge short range oscillator which definitely is a go it's a buy i expect a mild recession based on weakness in travel and entertainment but right now the oscillator is saying you should buy stocks both short and long term that's fantastic but what's really going on we have seen in the news with the imf and their pledge 50 billion dollars and the world bank just previous to that i believe it was 18 billion dollars each of the countries are probably going to do their own packages some of that information has come out already there's this massive flow of money that's making its way into the system and of course this they believe is going to find its way into these different corporations it's going to find its way into the stock market and so on there's something that I cannot discuss here, and I would just suggest to you to follow the money. Look at where this $50 billion is going. A large chunk of that, I think, is really key to understand. Unfortunately, I can't cover it, but do yourself a favor, look into that. This is an article just referencing the IMF $50 billion program. I thought it was funny because it was also that $50 billion program to Argentina that completely evaporated after it was given to them in a relatively short period of time. Of course, this is completely different, I understand, but I'm just not sure where they get these numbers of $50 billion. They just pick a number out of a hat. Why not? It's taxpayer money anyway. Most of the money will be interest-free. I wanted to note that because a lot of times with these programs, they are on terms these countries get these terms that they simply can't pay back that's part of the whole thing i don't know if this is going to be different this time usually it isn't but i'll keep my eye on it I wanted to show you this chart because it is important for people to understand what happens after there are emergency cuts. What the Federal Reserve did is unprecedented, not just because they cut, but because they cut 50 basis points. This 50 basis points is really key. It is also important to note the fact that the Bank of Canada cut at the same time, Australia cut at the same time, and I'm sure there have been many more. That global concerted effort shows us that we are entering into a crisis. Now take a look at this. S&P 500 returns in periods after the Fed emergency cuts. So in this column here, you're looking at the different dates. It shows you after one week, 
six months, as well as one year. If you see the median after one week, it's 2.8%. Then we look at it six months later, and then one year later, it goes from minus 4.3 to minus 9.2. So essentially, it looks like, based on history anyway, where we have a boost up initially, then it comes down, and then it comes down even further. That's key to understand, because the emergency cut, the market gets that adrenaline boost it loves it it's fantastic but then reality sets in and we have a dip down it depends on the situation it's not going to be like this every time what we are seeing today will be different than what we see tomorrow but it's just interesting to see the history and then watch every day as it happens the market has been extremely wild over the past couple weeks there's no denying that initially there was massive complacency then then out of nowhere, it just started to make sense to everybody, all the traders, all the investors. Oh my goodness, maybe we should sell our stocks. Now we're back to complacency again. I don't know what's going to happen in the coming days, but this whole up and down exaggerated move that's been happening is very dangerous usually that signifies a bear market rally but with the mass intervention that's been going on nobody really understands what could come around the corner and we're talking about people that have been in this industry for decades and decades and decades they've seen all kinds of changes they've seen these technological changes and, and modifications and everything that has been unprecedented in their careers and yet right now today, they don't know what the heck is going on. That should tell you something. Another day passes and another day of intervention. Fed's $100 billion repo intervention falls short of bank demand. Imagine that. You've got $100 billion in a day flowing from one direction into this market, supposed to be the most liquid market available, and yet $100 billion wasn't enough. They needed $111 billion. That was the request. All they could provide was $100. Now, previously, this was actually $120, and they thought they would be wise they thought that we would be smart by bringing it down to that 100 billion dollar mark as if this was their way of you know trying to taper off of the whole repo intervention and so on but of course that isn't the case didn't work because clearly they needed more than what was allowed at this point now is this $100 billion inflow into these markets having anything to do with what's going on in the stock market? Is that having anything to do with what's going on in the bond market? Well, it is an interesting correlation to say the least. Here we go with the repo operations. The data is available for you to check out right on the New York Fed's own website. We haven't talked about this in quite some time. I just wanted to point out right now, if you go to their website, you're gonna get the updated data. So depending on when you're watching this video, always go here and refresh the page because you're gonna see it for yourself. I know it's really small font, but what we're looking at here is the same data. Essentially, there was a submission for 111 billion dollars and they accepted 100 billion which is the max at this time we have been told time and time again that as of april they're gonna probably wean off of that and maybe it's not gonna be an issue anymore but in recent statements from the federal reserve they say at least that's the term that they keep using at least until april now i have a suspicion that it's gonna have to go beyond that regardless of the situation that's going on they just love to intervene you could see it here in chart form new york fed overnight repo liquidity facility accepted and while they didn't seem to be using that upper range 100 billion dollars when it was at 120 billion dollars it never seemed to get to that level so i think they felt confident at dropping that down to 100 billion still giving more than they need a nice high ceiling but in these cases here it looks like they may have made a mistake we're looking at two days in a row massively oversubscribed considering the fact that it's huge also want to point out the fact that we've been going back to september of 2019 and consistently day after day after day it remains a problem
with interest rates getting lower and lower, obviously people are going to refinance their mortgages. They're gonna refinance any and all debt that they possibly can. And you can see what has happened. This is the US Mortgage Refi Index, and that has been climbing basically from 2019 all the way through into 2020, and it has gone parabolic recently. This allows people to take on more debt, and that is, of course, good for the economy, not good for that individual, I would argue you, but they just stretch it out further and further and further. So for example, when we're talking about auto loans, for instance, a person has to pay, let's say $500 a month for their car. Okay, so $500 a month, fantastic. This is great. That's what they can afford. That's what they're going to pay. So do they decide that, well, now that the debt is cheaper, it's probably going to be more like 450. And I'm just making numbers up here, but 450. No, no, no. What do they do? They upgrade their model so that they can get to that 500. This is the point I'm trying to make. I always talk about how people get too far into debt and all this. Even when the debt is cheaper, even when their payments should be reduced, they don't do it in this way. They find themselves spending that extra money. Or if they're going to save that 50 bucks, what are they going to do? They're going to spend it. They're going to spend that cash away into confetti. Bank of Canada lowers overnight rate target to one and a quarter percent. That's right. It is a 50 basis point cut coming this time out of Canada. This coordinated action was expected and it's all due to the same reasons. We are looking at the global economic slowdown and you could see in these paragraphs here, if you take a moment to read it, oh, everything was going to be just fine just before this issue came up. And now, oh, okay, all of a sudden now we got to cut interest rates. 50 basis point cut in Canada is huge because the housing bubble has gone berserk. It's gone berserk. We are seeing it at a time in which people can't afford it right now. You look at it on any level, on any level whatsoever, real estate is way too expensive in the major cities in Canada. Of course, the same applies to basically major cities all around the world, but this is what I'm talking about at the moment. Bring interest rates down, people borrow more money, and you will see what happens to the debt that people have. They don't care. Ask the average person. They don't care how much debt they have. Is it manageable? Can I service the debt? It's an absolute joke, but I know I'm preaching to the choir. Crestcat Capital had this chart. I thought it was interesting. Times when the Fed and the BOC cut rates by at least 50 basis points in the same month. It shouldn't surprise you that we saw the same thing happen in the tech boom and bust as well as the global financial crisis. There's a coordinated effort that's going on today just as it was back then. When we see global central banks reacting in such a way, we know that number one, they're communicating with each other. They're going ahead with these plans very tightly because they know they're one step ahead of the game. They know exactly what's going to happen before it does because they're in control. This is an article out of the Wall Street Journal. Goldman Sachs estimates 10 to 15% of US GDP consists of services such as entertainment, restaurants, church services, and public transportation that would suffer if people limit interaction and avoid large gatherings. Goldman also estimates that this will knock roughly three percentage points off of the annualized growth in the next quarter with these demand side effects counting for almost half. So this is big. This is important to be paying attention to. There's no doubt. We don't know how that impact will be. And we only know, of course, after it happens, but they're pointing to some very good information. And he notes the fact that the Fed can't offset these effects simply by cutting rates doesn't change any of that. But of course, they're still going to go in this direction regardless, because there's something else going on. Top economist Ed Hyman sees zero US growth for the next two quarters. This would be huge if this actually occurs. Imagine, just imagine seeing the contraction going on on a global level, even though they're telling us that everything is fine, everything is fantastic. Certainly it's gonna have an impact and we'll just have to see how much as time goes on. 
I wanted to finish off with this chart here. You could see Wall Street versus Main Street. Main Street is described here on this chart as the US labor force participation rate. I would first like to know back in 2015, this bottomed out and it has been climbing ever since. The number is still very low, but it's getting better. Until you look at this on a deeper level, and then you realize actually people who were retired or are in their older ages need to be in the workforce. And that's the reason why this number has gotten bigger. But let's pretend I didn't say that for a minute and just be all happy and smiley. You try to be positive. Don't be so pessimistic, GPS. All right, regardless, we had some major differences in between prior to 2000 and afterwards. Clearly, there is a huge disconnect from the 80s leading into the 90s these two were correlated they were growing nice and evenly but after 2000 this declined significantly whereas wall street has clearly done very well i would just reiterate the point i made early follow the money follow the money follow the money that's all for this video if you found it informative hit that thumbs up button thank you for being one of the 10%. If you want to understand e-commerce and actually be able to provide yourself an income regardless of what's happening around you and your corporation that you work for and the business that you have, I created a free e-course for my subscribers to learn about this. You don't have to invest any money whatsoever. The AmazonGPS.com. If you are one of the few that's still out there that reads books, you definitely want to check out these two. Everything you need to know about the financial industry condensed down, taking away all that jargon, all that nonsense. Check them out at the link in the description. If you would prefer the audiobook, themoneygps.com. Well now, hold on, wait a second, don't go anywhere. This video is so key to understand what's happening. Click on it and I'll see you there.